Hello everyone, I'm Christopher Tan and welcome to Providence Money Wisdom, an original podcast inspired by my book Money Wisdom, Simple Truths for Financial Wellness. In this podcast, I'll be sharing simple financial truths to guide you in navigating through the minefields of misinformation and false promises in order to achieve financial security and peace of mind. Legacy Planning for Business Some years ago, on a company trip to Sabah to climb Mount Kinabalu, the tallest mountain in Southeast Asia at more than 13,000 feet, we had an adventure of our lifetime, a cat for white water rafting down Padas River. During the journey down the river, we had to overcome seven rapids. Everything went well till the fourth rapid, known as the washing machine rapid, where my raft capsized. Together with five of my colleagues, I was thrown into the river. Although I had my life vest on, the rapid caused me to be underwater for the longest time of my life. After some time, I could not hold my breath much longer and took in a lot of water. It was at that moment that I realized that I could actually die. Fortunately, I somehow floated and survived. This incident caused me to think about many things, and amongst them, what would happen to my firm, Provident, and my loved ones if I did not make it home. In this Money Wisdom podcast, we have spoken quite a bit about estate planning for our family, just in case we do not make it. But I think it's time for me to talk a little bit about perpetuating our business, just in case of our unfortunate demise. So, you are a successful business person. You have taken great pains to build a very profitable business. Naturally, in planning for your retirement or even your children's education, You expect the business to generate sufficient income to fund it. Upon your untimely demise, you expect the business to provide funds so that your family members can depend on it to support their lifestyle. But the truth is, if you have not made any plans to pass on the baton when you retire, retain the business within your family, or sell it away to third parties upon your untimely demise, you cannot depend on your business to fulfill all of the above-mentioned objectives. Before you start throwing stones at me, let me explain why I said so. You see, in all likelihood, you are the key person of the business, the major decision maker. Your unplanned exit from the business due to, say, premature death creates problems for the business that could be serious enough to threaten its survivability. Not only has the business lost its key asset, banks may lose confidence in the business ability to repay loans and may call back the loans prematurely. Suppliers to the business may stop all credit lines and employees' morale may be affected as they feel uncertain about their job security. As long as the question of who will be the new owner of the business remains unanswered, the future of the business is at risk. Without proper planning, it may go into a death spiral, which ultimately marks the end of the business. In such a situation, your business is more a liability than an asset to your surviving family. Without proper planning, it may never be able to support their livelihood. And because your business is a closely held business in the private market, there is no ready buyer to buy it and even if there is, he will most likely press the price down and your family ultimately suffers. Unless you desire to run your business until you are physically unable to do so, well, you will most likely want to hand it over to someone early and enjoy retirement. If you do not plan early for it, it is unlikely you would be able to retire. So, What are the concerns of business owners that I've just mentioned? Broadly speaking, there are two main concerns of business owners. Firstly, exit from the business due to death and disability or maybe even a medical crisis. And secondly, exit from the business due to retirement. So let's talk about the first one. That is exit from the business due to death and disability. 
depending on whether you are a sole proprietor or in partnership or running a private limited company, you have different things to worry about. The death of the sole proprietor usually means the demise of the business as well. Unless a successor has been identified and proper planning has been put in place, or the family has been involved with the business all along, the business will most likely end with the owner's death. In such a situation, there is no way it can be used to fund the family's financial objectives. It will be hard to sell away the business as there is practically no value attached to the business. For a partnership, the death of one partner also means termination of the business from the legal standpoint. The heirs of the deceased partner can form a new partnership with the surviving partners. However, this is subject to all partners agreeing to the new partnership, which oftentimes can prove to be difficult. Of course, the surviving partners can also offer to buy the interest of the deceased partner's estate. However, the problem here is for all parties to agree to the sale and purchase and especially the price. The deceased partner's family may want to be the silent partner of the business, but this may be unfair to the surviving partners as they now have to work harder without the contribution of the deceased partner and still receive the same sharing of profits. For the private limited company, the situation is almost similar to the partnership. Although in this case, the company does not automatically get wound up. The shares of the deceased shareholder get passed to the estate. If the deceased owner's family wants to be admitted as new shareholders of the business, it may be subjected to the approval of all of the surviving shareholders. If there is disagreement, the business may have to be liquidated. Similar to the partnership, if the surviving shareholders want to buy the shares over from the deceased owner's estate, they must come to an agreement, especially with the price. We all know that this can be difficult. If the deceased owner's family become the silent shareholder of the business, the surviving shareholders may be unhappy as they now have to work harder yet receive the same compensation. Well, sort of like the partnership that I've just mentioned they may frustrate the estate by not declaring dividends. This may cause a lot of infighting which may ultimately lead to the demise of the business. So, whether you are running a partnership or a private limited company, if there are no plans in place to retain or sell away your share of the business, you cannot depend on it to fund your family's lifestyle requirements the disability of the business owner may create even more problems than death. Besides the whole host of problems as I have shared earlier, disability due to an accident or illness causes or cause another problem. How long should the business continue before it should be wound up? The longer the business continues without its leader, the more the financials may suffer. Well, this is even worse for a sole proprietor because there is really only one leader. For a partnership or private limited company, how long should the business pay salary to the disabled owners? For the business, the longer it pays the disabled owner, the more the profitability will be affected. It may also be practically difficult for the surviving owner to stop payment too soon. For the disabled owner, Uncertainty persists as income is a concern, unless he has some personal insurance to cover family expenses. However, one thing remains clear. As long as there is no clear planning that is being put in place, difficult times exist for both the business as well as the de uh, deceased or rather the disabled owner. Now, let me talk about exit from the business due to retirement. At some point in time, you may want to slow down or retire from your business. But you can only do this if you have a plan to slowly leave the day-to-day -day running of your business to a trusted successor and still receive income from it. If you do not have a plan for it, you either have to work all the way until your last breath 
or watch the business that you have built slowly wither away. In transferring your business to an able advisor or able successor, you may have the following concerns. Well, firstly, providing yourself with a, sus a substantial stream of income for your retirement. Next, keeping the control of the business within the family. If you have been running the business as a family business all this while, this may be one of your objectives. However, if no one in the family is interested to carry on the enterprise, you must be prepared to hand over to an outsider, most likely your key executive or a younger partner shareholder of the business. Thirdly, you may want to be fair to all heirs. This is especially so if only some of your heirs are actively involved in the business. As the business is largely a substantial portion of your assets, you want to be fair also to the heirs who do not receive the business assets as an inheritance. Last but not least, if your intention is to hand over to a key executive of your organization, you will need to consider retaining him until the baton is passed. You will also need to consider training him to be prepared for that eventual day. So because of all these considerations, there are two areas of planning and there is a need to plan for your business as early as you can. So the two areas of planning that needs consideration are firstly, lifetime transfer of business and secondly, business continuation planning. So let me quickly talk about lifetime transfer of business. In this area, I will look at the considerations that have to be taken in order to plan for an orderly exit of the business owner in his lifetime. Now, due to time constraint, and I do not want to go on and on in a podcast like this, I will focus only on keeping it within the family. There are generally three matters in transferring the business to the family members. They are installment sales, the private annuity, and gifts of business interest in or through a trust. So let's talk about installment sales. The installment sales technique is a useful device in family financial planning. When the business owner wants to pass on the business to the family members, the business is so-called sold to the family members in exchange for an installment note. The note simply says the owner will receive a number of installments, say for example 10, when he transferred the business to a family member. Besides receiving a continuous income stream from the business, this method locks in the value of the business for estate duty valuation, especially if it is situated overseas. In Singapore, as we all know it, estate duty has been, um, has been, uh, has been abolished. Right? But like I said, you will still need to consider if you have business assets in other countries. However, all of the unpaid installments upon his demise may have to be taken into account for estate duty calculation purpose. Now, the second would be the private annuity. The private annuity is a variation on the installment sale as an estate planning technique. The private annuity is a method whereby the transferor transfer the business to the transferee in exchange for the transferor's agreement to make periodic payments of a specific sum to the seller for the remainder of the transferor's life. Upon the death of the transferor, the annuity payment stops and any unpaid annuity amount may be excluded from the transferor's estate. Thirdly, Gifts of business interest in a trust. Under this method, the transferor can set up an irrevocable trust to hold the business asset for the benefit of his heirs. During his lifetime, his heirs can start to take over the running of the business, gain experience and knowledge while the ultimate control of the business still resides with the entrepreneur. The business owner can act as a consultant or an advisor to the business in exchange for a continuous stream of income. For as long as he lives, he gets an income. Upon his unfortunate demise, the transfer of the business can take place and now the heirs has full control as well as beneficial rights to 
the business. Next, I just want to talk about business continuation planning. There are many ways to plan for business continuation upon the death, disability, and even a medical crisis of the owner. However, one of the most common methods is the use of the buy-sell agreement funded by life insurance. Well, the business owner goes into an agreement with existing shareholders, partners, or even key employees. The agreement states the sale and purchase price of the business, which, well, one has to review it frequently, and the agreement clearly states the terms and conditions under which the seller must sell and the buyer must buy. The purchase can be funded by using a term life insurance policy on the life of the owner. Upon the demise or disability of the business owner, shareholders, partners, or even key employees, well, they can use the insurance proceeds to purchase the business. Planning for the transfer of the business or its continuation upon the demise disability of its owner requires time and effort. However, it will surely be worth your while in knowing that you can depend on this investment that you have taken pains to build to fund all of your family's financial objectives. Well, if you found this to be useful and you need some help on this, do reach out to us and we should be able to provide you with some advice in this area of business exit planning. Thank you for tuning in to Providence Money Wisdom. I will be back soon with the next episode. For more information on my book or Providence services, kindly visit Providence.com. I'll see you the next time. All analysis, views or opinions from interviews, recommendations and other information broadcasted, podcasted or published herein are provided for general information purposes only. Information expressed does not take into account any specific situation, particular needs or objectives and should not be construed as specific advice or a recommendation. Information has been obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal or tax professional before taking any action. Provident Limited does not accept any liability for any loss whatsoever arising from any use of the information broadcasted, podcasted or published herein. All contents and information contained herein may not be copied or reproduced in whole or in part by any means without prior written consent of Provident Limited.